So um, in, in my experience, um, it is not uncommon uh, when an executive director leaves that a, a board chair steps in and becomes the acting interim CEO. Whether it's good practice or bad practice, we can debate, but I do hear something consistently from what happens in that experience. The board member, the interim director is shocked by what they did not know and did not understand about the job of a CEO. And I also know, having played the role of a CEO, that most executive directors I know believe their boards have no idea what they have to do during a day and what they go through, let alone feeling the pressure of raising money and managing a board. This creates all kinds of frustrations and missed opportunities. And I wanna talk about that some today, about how to manage that a little differently. And as uh, I mentioned to a little earlier, Anita Porco has joined us this morning, who we, she was my board chair at one point, and she also ended up being a um, associate working with me on the inside of the organization. And she can probably testify to um, most everything I'm saying, because today we're, we're not gonna do a typical board training session. It, this is gonna be a little different. We did one of those about nine months ago. And about six months ago, we did one on a board member's perspective of being on the board. And this one is what we call a deeper dive because we want to talk about some subjects we typically don't talk about and how to deal with them. Because board service is great. It's wonderful when you find yourself on a good board and it's miserable when you find yourself on a bad board. And it feels the same way to an executive director or a CEO. So we're going to get going on this. And I want to start with thanking a couple of people who've helped me put this together. This is a combination of, of my experience, obviously, but literature, best practices, helped particularly from uh, Ted Briggs, who gave me lots of information for this, Annette Lanjo from Arcus Foundation, uh, and some of the people that have been um, mentors of me over my career and my board work, including David Wexler, uh, Bruce Freed, and, and Anita Porco. So uh, could we start with a slide on, on what we want? Fortunately, um, there's a number of best practices that talk to us about a board functioning and roles and et cetera. But really, these are the things that both staff and volunteers want. We want to know what's going on. We, know, we want things to be accountable, valued, supported. I won't read the list. Um, but if when you start with this, it can become a benchmark to test your decisions about. So as you're making a decision about how you're putting your board together or how you're managing the agenda or whatever, this is a good list to go back and check against uh, your decision making. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, um, in in. Uh, detail here in a few moments. So let's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this down where I'm gonna talk about board members. I'm gonna talk about the CEO and board relationship. I'm gonna talk about the board as a whole. And then I wanna talk about a couple of things you can do that are hopefully very practical to help the overall health, health and culture of your board. And then talk about how to do a self-assessment of a board. Does that sound all right? People with me on this? Okay. So let's talk about a board member. Um, you want to put up the slide, please? So um, building a board is, is not easy. Fixing a board is not easy. Uh, but I want to say uh, to build the right board and to have the right board, it starts at recruitment and even before that in your brand. Uh, Paying attention to your brand in your community and your reputation in your community has a tremendous amount of impact on who you can recruit and how you recruit them. Um, but 
it's nice when people come to you and say you want to be on your board. It's a lot better when you go find the exact people you want to be on your board. And this uh, recruitment process, who you have asked, how you ask, is all very important to get the outcome. And then more so the selection. I like a situation where you have a couple of board openings coming up and you've got six good candidates and you're able to choose the one at the right time with the right skill sets you need that make up the right soup, the right combination. And, and once you do that, you need to pay attention to onboarding. Obviously, there's some obvious things you do. You furnish people with your um, uh, articles of incorporation, your bylaws, your conflict of interest policies, all of this. But really, you set the tone on that onboarding experience, how you prep a board member to come on the board. And it's more than just materials. It's helping them understand people. And there's a lot of ways people do it. Sometimes they set up a buddy system. But, but that has to be pretty clearly set out about what that is. And there's also this issue about getting the expectations of the new board member and your current board members on what it is that you expect from them as a board member. And we, we sometimes refer to it as a contract. And some organizations actually have a signed contract with their board members about what's expected. It's not common because we don't like to, to put it in that way. It's not comfortable for most people. But I want to talk more about that later. The other issue about setting the table and establish the tone is how much learning and sharing goes on at a board meeting. If board meetings are miserable and all you talk about is a financial problem or an HR problem, uh, it's not going to end up having a good culture. And board members, first of all, want to be engaged and share information. And we talk about the generative conversation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But your a board experience ought to be also a learning experience. And I, I will say on, on a couple of the boards that I'm currently serving, I've probably served on maybe two to three dozen not-for-profit boards and a few for-profit private corporate boards that if they're not learning experiences, it's a problem. Uh, because you want a board member to be an advocate for the mission and the cause and the organization. And they only can do that well if they and we are learning constantly about the content and the purpose. So, for example, I'm on the board of an organization called Save the Chimps that runs a large chimp sanctuary rescue center in South Florida. And over my time there, they taught me about uh, the great apes. They've taught me about the um, um, peopleness of uh, chimps. They taught me about what chimps have gone through and experienced, uh, what our mission is in relating to society in America of rescuing chimps and protecting them. And I feel like I'm an advocate. And when I'm out talking about what I do, I can talk with some authority about the chimps in America and what we need to do to protect them and save them and about them as non-human people. And to me, that is extremely powerful. So we need learning to be built in to how we set the tone and establish a culture. Second of all, uh, one of the problems with boards and with our experience as board members, but also from staff perspective, is that we wish our boards would show up and be their whole selves, not just an attorney or not just a, um, um, an advocate of some kind. Uh, and I wanna talk about that for a moment because I think that there's some really important lessons to learn. And it also goes to the issues of diversity, which I'll talk about more in a moment specifically. But I wanna talk about it, that what are the determinants of helping board members or creating a culture where board members can bring their full selves. And it's three things, and it's pretty simple. Uh, maybe it's not simple to figure out how to make it happen all the time, but you, if you have the vision clearly in your eye, it makes it much easier. And one is that a board member 
needs to feel valued and that they have a sense of self on the board. They understand what they're bringing to the table and they feel like that they're legitimately at the table. Second of all, uh, they need to feel like they belong, that they're not an outsider. And this is one of our problems when you're bringing in new board members is to give them that sense of belonging and owning together as a group, the success of the organization and its mission and the public trust that is required. Board members who come on because they got a pet peeve or they wanna do, you know, have some special agenda that's their agenda. Uh, will only cause you trouble. And, and not that people don't, it's not fair for them. It's fair for them to have an agenda and bring it to the table, but their agenda really needs to be being part of a very strong, successful organization uh, and belong to that group and to that family, so to speak. And third, board members need to feel like that they uh, can participate and contribute and to be heard and understood, valued, and ultimately feel like they have impact. And when the board is successful, they as individuals can feel like that that is partly due to their achievement. So sense of self, sense of belonging, sense of having impact and being heard, those are the determinants of helping board members bring their full selves. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, taking this just a little bit further and talking about something that's a little difficult is roles and role behavior on a board. We often train for roles. What are the roles of board members? Okay, there's chairs, there, da 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 da, uh, secretary, uh, finance chair, et cetera. And we think about describing those roles and there's roles in terms of their fiduciary fidelity responsibility. But I want to talk about role behavior because. Um, the truth is the values of the organization and the behavior of board members on a board come from what is demonstrated by leadership, by the CEO, by the board chair. It makes a tremendous amount of difference from the get-go. And when we are interviewing board members and assessing their value uh, before we select them to come on the board, it's very important to look and see what kind of skill sets they bring to the board in terms of behavior, not just you know, being an attorney or being a fundraiser or whatever, but do they know how to behave appropriately on a board? And I'm talking about being a gatekeeper, being a consensus builder, knowing when to be a compromiser, knowing when to be quiet and listen. This is a huge thing. For a board and we don't like talking about it because we also have people that bring miserable behavior to a board. People who keep talking about their own agenda, incessant talkers, the, and nearly every board has an interrupter. Um, and also the uninformed, the folks who don't read their agendas, don't read their programs, but have strong opinions. And this can make and I, 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 I would have you raise your hands, but I can't see all of you. But, you know, how many times have you been on a board or sitting in a board situation where you've got somebody who actually is making the board meeting miserable? Well, we need to talk about this. And I, I, I want to say our, our job is to manage and create safe places on boards uh, that support good behavior. So there's a few things that we can do. Uh, and um, first of all, of course, as I said, screen, be careful who you bring on your board. Uh, don't bring them on just because they give you money or they have some asset you want. They need to have a, a group of assets. Uh, and board leaders may need to be more proactive in uh, encouraging positive behavior and also address directly the negative behavior. This is not to do in a board meeting, but if you've got board members who are disruptive, who are disrespectful, who constantly make the situation miserable, the board chair needs to take that board member and talk to them. And I know it's the most miserable, awful, least favorite chore of a leadership, but if you don't do it, it can fester and it can get to where it damages the board significantly. So it's a, 
one of the ways of dealing this also is that when we think about um, um, board training, when we bring people in and you know have them talk about fiduciary responsibility and fidelity and all of this stuff, I also think that we ought to think about doing board training on group dynamics and group process and help build the skill set. Part of our problem is a lot of us are looking for the right board member all the time. And we should use these opportunities to help train ourselves as board members and or as executive trainers train our board so that uh, they operate well as a group. And, and kind of in a big picture, one of the things I always used to say is, you know, we, we, we treat our boards uh, like, okay, well, they're advisors, they're helpful, it's great, they're not functioning very well, but, you know, I'm the CEO, I'll get things done, blah, blah, blah. And we we uh, have a meeting in a room with no windows, we serve bad sandwiches, uh, we act like we're poor, and we usually are poor, but the messaging is all wrong. And I get to where, you know, when we think about homelessness, when we think about mental health, when we think about people dying uh, of AIDS or people with disabilities who never get a chance and parents who feel like they never get any kind of support, is that more or less important than Coca-Cola? And I think, oh my God, Coca-Cola pays their board members maybe $3 million a year plus bonuses. They fly them in private jets to meetings. And we're doing what I think is more important than Coca-Cola. And I just wanna say, we need to treat our board members and act like board members who are doing something extraordinarily important. And the whole tone needs to be set. And so that's how I get to this conversation about how to set expectations. So one is when you bring a board member on, know who they are and what, what they're bringing to the table. There's some reason you ask them on the board, know that. Now, obviously there's these moral and ethical requirements. Um, you wanna be careful and do a little uh, background search so you know you're not bringing on somebody who's, who's antithetical to your organization. But we often just focus on those special attributes, you know, whether they're um, um, great uh, representatives of the community or they have political networks or they have content expertise about the programming we do or they have these special skills that we often look for like legal marketing, finance, HR and fundraising. And I, I, I see a lot of what I, I, we call the grid, and maybe you haven't seen it, maybe I should do a specific workshop on it, but I know that when I was at United Cerebral Palsy, Anita Porco, and I created a grid where we, I think we had 16 things we could potentially be looking for, legal expertise, we listed the expertise, community relations, uh, network uh, leaders, uh, uh, influencers, da, 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 da. And then we took each board member's name and we checked the boxes of what that board member brought to the table. And then we took a look each year and said, okay, are those board members living up to the expectations about why we brought them on the board? And if not, we need to talk to them. And the truth is what we really needed to do, and we kind of did sometimes, and I'll talk about what you kind of do sometimes. Um, in a moment and the inconsistency of it is that we would take a look at a board member and say, you know, we brought them on to do this, but it's not happening. And so what do we do? Well, I want to suggest that it is the CEO and the board chair's problem. And it's their, it's our fault if the board member is not performing in what we expect, because we usually haven't told them what we expect of them very clearly. It goes back to the contract idea. And we also are not provided them with the kind of support to do what it is we expect them to do. So these organizations who just try to, oh, we need a lawyer on the board, we need a, a, a human a HR person on the board, boy, you better look at a much broader view of that. Uh, and you need to set the expectations. So uh, it's, it's a, um, um, an important issue because if you don't do this right, 
um, you're not getting what you need and you're not doing what we talked about earlier and helping a board member bring their whole self to the board. So this whole idea back about contracting, we're still going to talk about more in a moment when I have a little, when we're in another piece of this. Um, so I'd like to move on. I'm, I'm trying to cover some territory a bit, but I'm trying to focus, I'm going to focus on some of these things I think are a little bit more touchy issues. And I want to talk now about uh, the CEO and the executive director. Um, can you go up that one more slide, uh, Mihai? Uh, uh, yes, let me talk about diversity. This diversity is, is um, actually next. And you know, a lot of boards are spending some time, um, particularly in social justice and human services, deliberately working on learning about the impact of racism and equality of opportunity. Uh, and um, we, oh, excuse me, just a second. I need to get my phone off. Um, and um, it, it's very important for us to do this, but a lot of people I know are going, okay, so what do we do with that? What do we really do within our organization to deal with all, all what we're learning about diversity? And I wanna, I wanna talk about um, checking boxes and tokenism for a moment. So um, a year or so ago, some of us were doing a group of grant uh, reviews, and we asked the question about diversity. And generally, we got very poor answers. People didn't understand it, or people would say, well, we've got a Black person on the board. Okay, well, what does that mean? And personally, as a gay man, I have been put on many boards because I was a token including the California Endowment. Now I had to bring a lot of other stuff to the table to get on that board, but really they started looking for me because they wanted a, a probably a safe you know, guy uh, at that point uh, as a token. And I, I understood that. And, and a lot of us have to deal with that. And of course, you're, if you're a person of color and have any kind of public profile, you probably are being asked to serve on more boards than you ever imagined because everybody's looking for that person of color to be on the board. Um, so I think the key here is that you've got to be careful and you've got to be honest in the selection of board candidates. And as a board candidate, you also need to be honest. So uh, a couple of years ago, Kara Vancer, I was recruiting a, a friend of ours, a woman we'd worked with um, uh, many years ago named uh, Armetta Parker. She's a black woman. And when we asked her to be on the board, she said, are you asking me to be on the board because I'm a black woman? And we said, absolutely. More than that, but absolutely. But we don't want you to just be a black woman. We want you to really be a black woman on the board. We want you to bring that experience with you. We want you to be your whole self. We want you to look through the eyes of a black woman at what we're doing and make sure we hear every bit of it. So it's more than just checking the box about race or gender, uh, et cetera. It's much more about be, making sure th that they bring that diversity and be it. Uh, and we need to be honest and clear with each other about those expectations. Bring our whole self because it brings experience and knowledge. And so my view is when I feel like I'm being brought on a board as a token, I turned that around in my head and said, I, I'm not gonna be just a token to these people. I'm, I'm gonna be a champion on that board. Uh, next slide, please. So this gets back to what I was saying earlier about people bringing their full self and their experience that people, everybody, and the folks that you know are now the diverse folks really have a safe place to bring their full self, be part and a sense of belonging and definitely to have influence and impact. Otherwise it's BS. 
Now, the other thing is that it's not just about, you know, having diverse people on the board isn't that great. And we're going to do things better because of that. We need to actually pay attention to the value that a deliberate and explicitly having a diverse board brings to an organization. And I want to say it broadens everybody's thinking. It increases relationships with different communities and different beneficiaries that you may be serving. It clearly changes the way you do decision-making. And diversity can come in a lot of ways, by the way. Um, for example, um, I think on our UCP board, uh, when Anita and I were there, we had a bunch of lawyers and, they, and business people, and they were great. They were very linear thinking. And we went and got a heiress who was a tango dancer, and I don't think she had a linear thought in her head. And we brought in Cheryl Hines, who is an actress, wonderful, smart, nonlinear thinker, an actress who had her emotions right here, could grab them easily, much easier than most of us. And we found that our board meetings changed immediately because they respected each other, but they would think through a problem totally different than other people and make us talk about things differently. Well, those are just two kind of examples about how you approach a problem. And you know, a lawyer approaches things uh, in a sense in, in problem solving about how to avoid risk. Uh, a doctor does it in a different way. Professionally, he's trained to do a real analysis, a diagnosis. And a business guy, an MBA guy, a woman needs to, learns to do it a different way. You need all of those ways to um, approach uh, um, problem solving and bring the richness. And it also includes people who have had lived experiences that are very different. And we know, for example, in our work, that those people who have struggled who have maybe immigrated, maybe have dealt with poverty or dealt with lack of access to infrastructure and resources, they are usually more resilient. They are probably better problem solvers and they work harder at getting through a problem because they have to. They are often sometimes bring the richest experience to decision-making than anybody else uh, makes. So I, I, I want to say, not only do we need to have more diversity and let go of power and move that power exchange to others, and we need to make sure that we do not tokenize people as we move towards being more diverse in hopefully everything we do, but understand and appreciate that it brings a whole lot of value uh, that we um, often don't recognize, but we not only need to recognize it, we need to capture it. So let me stop for just a moment. I know Bradley and Mihai are monitoring the chat and I'm, I'm not uh, as I'm walking through these. Is there anything going on in chat I need to know or respond to? Uh, not necessarily questions, but Taharima had some really amazing comments and so thoughtful. Thank you for, for, sharing, for sharing them with us. Okay. And you're talking about uh, diversity issues? Yeah. Great. Thank, well, thank you. Great. Yeah. All right. Let's go. I want to I want to talk about the CEO uh, executive in the board now. So thank you for the time on that. So this this is often a um, crazy relationships. Sometimes there's wonderful, wonderful relationships between board and execs, uh, and sometimes it's uh, difficult. But I want to speak to the CEO for just a moment. Um, when you're a CEO and you've got a board and you go through a training like this or any of the trainings, you think of all the things that you should and could be doing and how much better you could make the board. But you need to be realistic about uh, expectations of yourself because it's, I, and I say this, in the private sector, 
a CEO has about five things. They're not easy, but five things they really need to focus on to make the private sector business work. And I believe that a not-for-profit, you have 20 things you have to do. Often your revenue is not connected to what you actually do. Um, you've got reputational and advocacy work that's absolutely different. And, and you just have to be realistic and be honest about what you can and cannot get done. And so, and I'll say this later again, but think of working with your board as a continuous improvement project. Also, I will say that if you've been in your job for 10 years and you've got a really crappy board, it's your fault. And you need to get on it because you deserve the board you have. Uh, executive directors have a tremendous amount of influence about how their board is built because you typically, if you've been there for any amount of time, you've lived past a few board chairs. So the consistent party there is you. So you need to think about what are the priorities and key pressure points of making your board stronger. And one of them is your communication and your ability to disclose. And what I want to say about that, if you're new on your job and you've been there a month and you haven't talked to every board member personally, you're crazy. <laughs> you need to have a plan and a, you know, maybe a list on your desk and check and put a check mark every time you talk to one of your board members and see who you're talking to and not talking to. And you need to be talking to all of them. The other thing, it's about disclosure. I, I had a board chair after Anita at UCP, who is an attorney, and he started asking me a question that scared me to death. And it was the smartest question. And it was simply at the end of every conversation, he would say to me, what else do I need to know? Now, when an attorney asks you that, <laughs> Well, on your board chair, I'm, I'm like ruffling through paper, looking at my notes. What else? What else? I got to tell him everything. I also learned over time that if anything went wrong or looked like it was going wrong, the very first thing I did is I ran to the phone and called my back then, ran to the phone and called my board chair and told them the worst. Because trust is the issue. And and it, it helped me because uh, in, in all of my jobs, I've made numerous mistakes as a CEO and mistakes that the board probably had the right to terminate my employment over. They weren't um, intentional mistakes. They were good faith, but nonetheless, they were some huge ones. But I survived them all because I think I had trust between the board chair and I. And the only times when I've ever really wanted to quit a job or leave is when I couldn't trust my board chair. And the same is true on the reverse side. If the board chair and the board doesn't trust their uh, CEO, the CEO can do everything perfectly, but her time is numbered. It's over. It's just a matter of time. So, there's a lot of things the CEO, of course, has to do, as I said, but relationship building is key. Um, then there's this issue about power. And power flows and ebbs. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more specifically also when we talk about self-assessments. But it's very uh, important to be clear about whose role is what and not get confused. So when... Um, uh, when I have a board member say to me, you know, I, I saw one of your staff members saying such and such, I'm a little concerned. I would say, well, don't you speak to them. I'll speak to them. That's my job. And if I saw a board member being inappropriate or doing something that wasn't quite right, I would, I would call my board chair and say, you, you have a board member that's misbehaving and you need to talk to them. That's your job, not mine. You get in partner sometimes. In, in, a, in a problem sometimes when the board has historically been involved in management and doing management jobs instead of uh, board jobs. And that's a hard thing to uncouple. But, and, and boards won't let go unless they trust the CEO. Uh, and so that, that's an issue. Uh, but the key relationship is the CEO and the board chair the chemistry between those two people and the trust between those people is absolutely key. And I know when I first 
became like CEO of United Cerebral Palsy, I think we had six CEOs in seven years and the board was out of line. They were just impossible. And uh, uh, Anita became board chair at that time as I took my position. And I know that Anita and I talked on the phone at least once a day. We were partners and we had big work to do but we were partners and it made all the difference in the world. And that sense of partnership in helping the operation and business succeed is not only essential, it's also one of the most powerful and rewarding things when you can feel like you're in a partnership with your board chair. Then there's this issue of who makes decisions and when and how. And there's a problem. I always think that if a CEO has been in their job for 15 years or more, they think it's their organization and their boards will come and go and they'll make the decisions. I'm sure none of you have seen anything like that in your careers. <laughs> but I, I saw a situation not long ago where uh, the board was introduced to some major projects that the organization thought they wanted to do. And the board said, great, well, let's talk about them. And the CEO says, yes, you know, no decisions have been made and I want your input and participation and, and et cetera. So we come back to the next board meeting and instead of having a conversation about whether we should do these projects, they had hired consultants to work with us board members to get our input on how these projects would work. And I found it very offensive uh, that it was a presumptive close on us. I felt like it was manipulative. Well, the truth is there's a fine line between a CEO managing a board and manipulating a board. And there needs to be some real honest conversation about who is really making decisions and when and how. Because if you disenfranchise your board, you don't have a board. And if the board cannot step up and be clear and take their responsibility in relation to a CEO, then they, they've got a CEO that's not performing right. So um, it, it's a, this power issue is huge. And it's something that there's no quick and easy solutions for, but it's got to be understood. And the best situation is when the CEO and the board chair talk about all major decisions together and together decide whether it goes to the board or the, it's a staff decision. So uh, let's move on because I, I want to hit some other things. Uh, but I'd also, let's talk about the board in general for a moment. So um, there's a lot to be said about board meetings, uh, structures and committees and culture. And a lot of this is in terrific literature that you can find on board source um, and a lot, of, a lot of stuff out there. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it because I wanna talk about it, things that I think are a little bit more um, important. So, but let me just say, uh, uh, ill-prepared board meeting is gonna be a problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, you want to make your board members never embarrassed about their role and what happens at a board meeting. And preparation is key. You always need to make sure your functions are working. You've got a financial report that's good. You've got a clean audit that you've paid your taxes, all of those things, the responsibility. Um, you need to be clear about what decisions need to be made, and you need to have learning and generative conversation at a board meeting or you take away the reason why board members are there. So I want to keep moving. And, and so uh, a board has its committees, and there's some that are required in your bylaws, and then there's others. And I want to recommend in general that you only have a standing committee, those that are required with the bylaws, and the rest of them be ad hoc, so you can determine over time whether you want to keep them going or not. Because committees take staff and follow up. If you don't staff them and do follow up, you, it, they're not going to function well. And it's a tremendous amount of work. So I, I try to keep it to a minimum. I think one thing we just have to remember here in California, particularly you have to have a finance and an audit committee and they have to be separate. They can't be the same committees. Uh, that's a Stark law. Uh, it's, a, it's a law here, a regulation here. Um, you also 
<laughs> don't ask people to volunteer to serve on a committee. Board chairs, don't do that. Don't ask for volunteers. Appoint them and make it clear that the chair does import appointment them. You need to choose carefully who you have serve on a committee and make sure you have the right grouping. If you just do it by asking people to volunteer, you're going to end up with some lousy committees that are miserable. And when you're actually recruiting for new board members, you need to be thinking about the skill sets for these committees, whether it's fundraising or finance or HR or whatever. You don't want to find yourself after a couple of years realizing you've got no bench strength in these areas. So you need to pay attention up front about what your needs are going to be for your structure and your functioning. And in, in terms of your dynamics and there, there's off, often a sense of groupthink, and a lot of people work towards it to build consensus on every issues. And it can become a um, problem for a board uh, that uh, you're not having honest conversation. You don't allow people by the culture to talk about the truth. And the truth is important. Uh, board culture also needs to recognize and support questioning, but with respect. And I, I, I'm going to tell you one quick story and then I'm going to move on, but I, I'll try to make a point. But I, I started a software company back in the late 90s, and uh, the board was in our investors, and they were a pretty hard group. And people would come to the board and they'd say, oh, I got a great idea. I think this is a market we ought to be targeting and going after. And I think it's very important. And the, one of the other board members would say, well, that's interesting, but let's push that around the table a little bit. And so one of them would say, no, it, you know, we're early on. We got to focus on the basics. That's not a basic. We don't need to go there yet. It's fine, I'm dear, I'm sure. But no, let's don't even have it on the table. And we'd go around and people would have various opinions and we'd say, do we need to have a vote on this? And they say, no, we don't have a consensus. We're not gonna do this. This is not happening. Or we'd take a vote and it would lose three to two. And everybody was fine. It was great. They were glad we had a consideration of the idea. I don't see that much in the not-for-profit world. People bring up an idea and Matt be screwy is all get out and we all go, oh, that's wonderful. Well, we'll have to look into that. Maybe we, you know, we'll, we'll come back and have a report on it or something. And we all know in our hearts, this is bull. Well, <clears throat> we've got to do things a little differently. And I think part of it is that we've got to, of course, go back to making sure we bring the right people on the board and that we've got to encourage positive behaviors, but we also need to pay attention to the language we use and the facilitation skills that we have and use them. And the language we use, we need to think about language that depersonalizes it and, de and reduces the emotion of it. Because on a not-for-profit board, a lot of us are there for our kind of emotional needs or things that we care about. And so I find uh, not-for-profit boards much more personalized, much more sensitive, much more, you know, get upset about things when really we're just trying to talk about how to make the organization successful. And so we need to think about the language we use and we need to use facilitation skills and not let either the group think, uh, smother, honest talking, that we allow and respect uh, questioning, and that we constantly build the idea that we are one family, one community committed to a cause. And because you bring an idea that the board didn't particularly like, doesn't mean you're any less important to that community that's committed to the cause. Okay, so um, I want to talk about uh, some techniques um, and uh, one of them is this idea of what we call four questions for the board. And uh, uh, taking, stepping back for just a second. So um, 
One of the things we think has really been a problem during COVID is boards haven't had the opportunity to talk candidly to each other and to have those sidebar conversations and all those relationship building up conversations. And many of us have got on boards. We try to get through them a little quicker because we're sitting in a chair on a video and we're listening, 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 take a vote, hear another report and listen, listen, listen. And I mean, this morning, um, on the board meeting I'm on, we did the minutes, we did the finance report, we did the audit report, we had the CEO's report, we had the program report, we had a quality evaluation report, and there was four hours. And I probably spoke for three minutes in the finance report, I'm chair of the finance committee, and the rest of the time I sat there and listened. Ugh. So... I want us to think about how we can cause deliberate conversations to occur that engage board members that increase honesty and authenticity. And so we've taken an idea and adapted it and we've tried it in as a pro bono facilitation with four organizations here in the region in the Inland Empire. And what we've done today is we kind of put it together and created a, um, um, an exercise for you to do. And it's these four questions that are listed here. Now, I'm gonna go into some detail, but to help you do this right, we're going to uh, have a takeaway for you uh, that walks you through explicitly how to do this exercise. Uh, there's also an article on our blog that's just been published about it so that you will have not only the, the article, you will actually have the details of how to do the exercise, but I wanna talk about it for just a moment because I think you'll get the point about why we're suggesting this. So the first question, we ask these four questions to a board. If we have time, we let them answer all of them. If we're short of time, we'll ask a board member just to respond to the one where they feel like they have the most to say. But <clears throat> under this first question, and I'm not gonna read the questions, you can read the question, but under this first questions, kind of our prompts are, are, what are the most important headwinds that you're seeing today? And do you see the, what's happened with climate change or conservation or racism any differently now than you did a year ago? And are there implications for our actual work? Um, and is there something that you worry might, that might take us by surprise? On the question of opportunity, the prompts are, um, what might the state or federal government or local government do that could unilaterally affect our work? Uh, and are there things that you think will be decided or changed in the next four years that affect who our partners are and what they do and our mission? And are there engagements and partnerships we should be forming? And do you see any windows closing on us or windows now opening on us that we ought to be prepared to jump through? So, and then um, the third about the role of our, the organization is really think about, um, have you seen philanthropy change during COVID? And where do you think philanthropy is going? And we ask this question because some of you may be philanthropies and have the question to ask yourself, but many of us are grant seekers or recipients of funding from philanthropies, and we need to pay attention to where their head's at. But when I say we, in this exercise, what we're asking our board members to do is each of them talk about what they see and what they know and get their view and opinion. And in the last one, it even gets a little bit more personal. So we're asking people what they've learned during this 18 months, both professionally and personal, that we should consider. I mean, it's been pretty seismic on us and impacted all of us. The idea of, is, is the next Delta gonna create another shutdown? Uh, I mean, there's things I don't even know we'll find acceptable, but what might be some of our blind spots in terms of, the, of this change and maybe permanent changes in the future? Are we going to continue to do a lot of Zoom meetings? Are we going to run to be back together in person? Uh, how are we going to change our communication? Or uh, are there ways that you see people dealing with um, the mental health issues surrounding COVID? 
So anyway, it's 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 a it's an exercise to help deal with the isolation and separation that's been caused and has reduced communication and the rich, richness and in interaction. And so it's not um, something we're saying, oh, you got to do this, but we're suggesting you consider this or something to have a conversation that's authentic and honest with your board. Okay, now we're going to go to the last section and I'm going to wind this up. But this is not a small one. So a lot of boards hire strategic uh, consultants to do their strategic plan in a way that's some form of doing an assessment. But we want to suggest that you do some self-assessment. And I've been working with a number of consultants, both on where I sit on boards, but also as a um, consultant to others uh, through Care of Answerai. And I want to talk about how we do a self-assessment and really um, can understand better where we need to focus our work because going back to a CEO being realistic about what time they have and energy and resources to do all the things you could do for a board and with a board and same with board volunteers that you need to have some strategy around it and understand what you really need to be doing and what are the priorities. So this assessment idea is um, to give you some ideas about how to approach that. First of all, you need to gather information from folks and the best way to do it is surveys and interviews and, and uh, of your board members to start with, but some organizations literally will do a 360. Um, and then, uh, a committee doesn't need to go away and decide this. They may need to synthesize it or somebody needs to synthesize it without editing it and bring it to the full board for review and discussion. And this also, when done correctly, can provide a huge opportunity for authentic and, and honest conversation. And then you don't need to write a 20 five page plan with diagrams or have a consultant do it, but you need to put together a three or four page, maybe internal plan to respond on what the board could be doing and staff leader could, could be doing that would be considered a priority to help the board function better and play their role stronger. So let's go to the next slide because I wanna talk about what it is you evaluate on and some ideas for that. One is I, I doubt that most of us have a job description for the board. We have job descriptions for our staff. We have job descriptions maybe even for board members, but we don't really have a job description for our board. And I wanna suggest that it's not a bad exercise to do one and don't make a mountain out of a molehill here. Maybe use a staff job description as a goal, but it's really about what they're supposed to be doing and what they need to get done in the next 18 to 25 to 24 months, some framework work, and maybe some framework that's consistent if with a strategy plan, if you have one. But if you do that, it creates a baseline for testing against uh, other things that you think you may be doing. Um, secondly, I think it's very important to do an honest self-exam on how you're dealing with racial, ethnic, and gender issues, and not only about your policies and programs, but how, what, how, how honest your diversity is and what you're doing about it. And third is always a board doing the self-assessment. What is the board's responsibility towards the fundamentals? And that's making sure your numbers are good, your financials are clean and honest, that your audit is clean, that you have a compliance list that the board checks of all the things you need to make sure you're complying and that your taxes are done and the board has seen them. And then you want to do a little bit of assessment of the power balance, which we talked about earlier. What is the culture of leadership? How does the flower of power flow back and forth? Uh, where are decisions made? What's the balance of board time and energy spent on governance, on content, on programmatic leadership, on, on uh, strategic leadership? These are the kinds of things that you can ask as questions uh, to uh, the surveys and interviews and get people's thought. Um, the next thing here is about the board mix and I like to call it the soup. Do you have the right group? Not about the individuals, it's the right group. And I, I'm on a nominee, nomination committee for one board and we use a professional firm to recruit our board members. And 
they just bring us these incredible candidates. And, you know, after we interview three of them, we think, ah, I want them all. And ultimately, the decision is not, we, we can't have them all, is the one that makes the right mix with what we've got. That either takes us to the next level or covers an area that we're really lacking or has the personality and the facilitation um, skill set that we really need to make the soup, to make the mix right. And of course, it also includes um, the diversity issues. Another great question is to ask people, can you give us an example of something the board uh, did that was really good, really successful? And can you give us an example of where you think the board really failed uh, and didn't do their job or did something bad? And it's an interesting debate uh, because sometimes it may be an outcome of a policy and 60% of the board think the policy was terrific and 40% thought it was bad. It, it, it's really good if you have those because you learn a lot from that and we usually don't bother to stop and learn. And when the stakes get higher, this is even more important, okay? And then you need to look at uh, your board, your relationship with your executive director or CEO. Now, you, you should do a performance review of your executive director and CEO on a re regular basis. They should know what they're being evaluated about in advance. You should give them fair warning. You should do uh, you know, a fair evaluation, give them honest feedback. But the list here is really not about their overall performance, it's about their performance in relation to the board. Are they trustworthy? Do you still trust them? Do they exhibit the values and the respect that you need from the staff? Whose agenda comes to the board? Is it always their agenda or is it an agenda created by the CEO and the board chair? Or do they not pay any attention? And how is their communication with the board? How do you well you feel informed? Do you feel like they're being hidden things from or they're telling you the truth? Are they giving you enough information? Or are you too bombarded with details that you don't need to know as a board member? And last is, do you see them as being supportive of an organizational culture, both with the staff, with the people that benefit from your work and your board? And these are, these are the things when it comes to evaluating an ED's work with a board and the overall big picture, aside from all the other things that you would evaluate a board chair, a board member on. So kind of in preparation of a self-assessment, it's handy to do the job description and have a performance review of the uh, key uh, players. Um, I wanna say, and I'll close with this once again, is trust is the key. Communication builds trust. And I think that um, our goals are constantly to just keep learning more and developing a program, both as board chairs, board leaders, and CEOs of continuous improvement. You're not going to get all this done overnight. It's too much. You'll just continually to work to get better and find champions on your board who can be totally aware of this and helping you get this done. And you've got to do it with a value, uh, where you value one another, you listen, you respect each other, you act in good faith, and you build trust. So uh, I've talked about some things that are usually not talked about. And I think it's uh, they're overdue, but I appreciate everybody's time, and I'd like to uh, um, stop and see if there's any uh, questions or comments. Uh, and I can't um, see them. So if Bradley or Mihai want to throw any comments my way, please do it. 